well, I make it 6.02 now. Uh, so I'm Felicity Gerry, Queen's Council, member of Libertas Chambers. Welcome to our Libertas lecture on criminal just justice responses to maternal filicide. Um, I'm sure you've all had the opportunity of reading the summary of this webinar, which will present case analysis and research on women suspected of killing their newborn children, uh, their vulnerability and the modern implications of, of infanticide in society. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Emma Milne, who is Assistant Professor in Criminal Law and Criminal Justice at Durham University Law School. Uh, the focus of her research is the social, legal and cultural controls and regulations of all women. She's currently looking at attitudes and perspectives held by legal professionals to women suspected of causing the death of their infants. And her project is funded by the BA Leverhulme Small Grants. Um, Emma, it's absolutely fantastic to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. I think it's really, really important to discuss, if you like, the way in which the criminal justice system works or frankly doesn't work for women. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased that we're discussing it in the context of maternal filicide, which is such a complex and uh, difficult area for those of us as practitioners. Uh, we'll be we will no doubt benefit enormously from your research. Um, as you know, and just to remind everyone who's here, the format is for our experts to give a lecture, a Libertas lecture for about half an hour. Then I will chip in with some stories and some practical skills, experience and ideas so that the uh, webinar is useful for both practitioners and academics. And if you're a member of the public, merely interested in this topic, and hopefully those of you who work in policy who can consider how the criminal justice system might need to improve itself or, or might need to be improved. Uh, so that's, as always, quite a long introduction from me so that I can just remind everyone what we're talking about. And I'll now hand over to Dr. Emma Milne to present our Libertas lecture. Thanks, Emma. Thank you so much and thanks for the invite and for everybody who's attended. It's um, great to be here to be talking about this research. So this, this work effectively is uh, what is, I've just published in my book. So the book came out in September. Uh, so obviously I can't publish, I can't talk about the entire book. So I've kind of tried to narrow down some of the key themes that I'm going to be looking at and, and talking about. So just to give you some, some background on the book and, the, and, and effectively what I did, so you can see how I've come to the analysis and the conclusions that I've, uh, I've, I've, um, I'm gonna to present today. What I looked at was 15 court transcripts from criminal hearings from cases in England and Wales that were heard between 2010 and 2019. And the cases related to women who were suspected of causing the death of their newborn children. And I'm really specific that I use that phrase causing the death rather than homicide or killed, because as those of you who are in the legal profession will know, one of the large issues around uh, newborn child death is uh, related to whether or not there is proof of live birth, because that has a significant impact upon the nature of the law and, and how that can be applied to the cases. So I looked at cases that ranged from homicide offences, so convictions for murder, infanticide, and diminished responsibility. I also looked at cases where the child was born alive and the woman was convicted of a child cruelty offence, um, and as well as cases where either there was no evidence of live birth or there was clear evidence that the baby wasn't born alive, in which case offences such as concealment of birth, procuring a miscarriage were used instead. Um, there's, there's also a further case which I wasn't able to include because the transcript had been destroyed um, prior to me accessing it where um, infant life, uh, the Infant Life Preservation Act was, uh, was used in child destruction was the offence there. So a real array of criminal offences cross over these, these cases, which in some respects you might argue, what can that do to help us understand the law and how the law is working and how the law is being applied, but actually 
hopefully, as you'll see from, from what I'm going to present now, actually, there are very clear themes that cross over these cases uh, and clear, um, what I would argue, are suggestions as to, to how these women's behaviour is uh, seen and talked about and then dealt with through the criminal law. So these, these array of offences that I um, that are applied to these cases are what I call the menu of offences. And I'm quite specific with that because what I'm part of what I'm arguing is that the way in which the criminal law is structured around this area, there is effectively an array of offences that the Crown Prosecution can Service uh, can pick from and decide which one they're going to use, depending upon the circumstances. So it's less, I would argue, less about um, particular women and what's going on with them and more about ways in which the law can be used in order to criminalize their conduct. So all of these cases that I looked at, um, all bar one, none of them uh, went up to uh, the Court of Appeals. So what I was looking at was transcripts from the, um, the Crown hearing. Most of them were cases where the woman pleaded guilty. So I was looking at the sentencing remarks and a couple of the cases the women didn't plead guilty in which case I was looking at select parts of the, the trial transcript. And I was very much looking at them to, to, in two ways. Firstly, how were the women discussed in terms of their conduct, in terms of the moral attitudes that were reflected and, and um, how they were, were seen as people and seen as mothers, particularly. That's a theme that's gonna be really prominent during this lecture. And then secondly, how the offenses were used. What I'm going to focus on in today's, um, in, in what I'm presenting to you, is more thinking about how the women were discussed and, and represented and talked about through the process of their court hearing. Um, but I'd happily talk about the offences later in questions if, if that is of interest to anybody. So just to, to reiterate and to just do this briefly, just in case there are people here who aren't um, working in the legal profession, the, uh, the law in England and Wales works on the basis that if you have evidence of a child being born alive, then you, that child will be treated in exactly the same way as any other person born alive, so any of us, and the criminal offences that can be used if that child either dies or comes close to dying um, will, will reflect the criminal offences that could be used to, to any child of older age. So for, specifically here, we're talking about homicide offences and child cruelties. However, in England and Wales, we don't have any um, specific homicide type offences that protect fetuses. So that's unlike uh, what we have seen develop in the United States, where they do have very specific fetal homicide law in most states now. Instead, in instances where there is no evidence of live birth, or perhaps there is clear evidence that the fetus died prior to birth, procuring a miscarriage, child destruction and concealment of birth are much more likely to be the criminal offences that are going to be drawn upon and used. So these cases, just to give you a bit of background and a bit of indication as to the nature of the 15 cases. So I categorise these offences, these cases under this broad umbrella of suspected perinatal homicide. So perinatal is the window around the time of birth. Um, within my research, I, I categorise that window as um, from the 24th week of pregnancy up until the first day of um, life following birth. The 24 weeks reflects the, the way in which abortion law operates in this country. So technically um, a woman can access an abortion for general reasons of not wanting to continue a pregnancy um, up to 24 weeks. After 24 weeks, there is this further limits put in place. So that's the, that's the lower end. And then the higher end is because the literature around newborn child killing indicates to us that a um, child is most likely to be killed um, in that first 24 hour window if it's in a case like this. If, if the child survives that first 24 hour window, then it's, its chance of being killed by its mother actually significantly reduced. So that's this perinatal window that I'm talking about. But all of these cases very much need to be understood and seen as crisis pregnancies. So these are instances where for one reason or another, the woman was unable to accept or address the fact that she was pregnant. In some of the cases, there's some indication that she had some awareness and some knowledge of her pregnancy. Perhaps it was a transient awareness. Um, so there's evidence from a couple of cases of the women doing um, Google searches around things related to pregnancy, such as how to access an abortion, whether or not um, they would still have a period if they were pregnant. So indication that they probably at certain times knew they were pregnant. 
but for other periods of that it would appear they they weren't completely aware they were pregnant or if they were aware they were actively trying to hide it from the world around them now one of the things i always say about this is for me this is we very much need to understand these as crisis pregnancies because it's not the normal conduct of a woman when she gets pregnant and she realizes she can't be pregnant for whatever reason for her to hide that pregnancy and wait till she gives birth. The normal conduct there is going to be she's going to access an abortion and, and deal with that um, pregnancy. That hasn't been what's happened in any of these cases. And, and I think even more remarkable about them was that the women wait so long and they get all the way through to uh, when they are giving birth. And the mixture of the, the denial and the concealment effectively results in these women giving birth on their own, often in their bathrooms, often into their toilets, because they don't realize they're giving birth, they actually think they're having a bowel movement. So I think often these cases can be very much represented both in the courtroom, but also in the media as uh, almost suggesting that these women have actively gone out of their way to hide the pregnancy because they want to kill the baby. And that, that just doesn't really reflect what's actually going on with these women and the crisis that they're in, particularly when we look at their, their wider social circumstances and situations. So they're generally very young women. They um, are often living in abusive and violent situations, have become pregnant as a consequence of rape and other sexual assault. Um, have issues related to substance abuse, family relations, um, some, some very strict family circumstances and dynamics, uh, as well as um, a significant amount of poverty. So very you know, vulnerable in terms of their wider circumstances that effectively hasn't helped and assisted them in this, this situation. So one of the key things there, when they give birth, when they're, when they're um, birthing in, um, in their kind of bathroom usually, there's this question as to the extent to which they are actually then in control of their conduct and in control of what they're doing during the birth and then in the postpartum period. So um, there's research that would suggest that when women do kill the infant following birth, actually that killing happens often in a disassociative state, in a state of shock without the woman potentially having complete rational control over what she's doing. And actually a lot of the time these, these babies, if they are born alive, they end up dying as a consequence of the woman not doing anything to assist them. And again, we've had a couple of cases reported where that woman has actually passed out following birth. So there's a question as to, you know, was she even, did she even have the capacity to assist in that respect in terms of even being awake and aware of what was going on? So one of the key kind of conclusions that I draw is that the way in which these pregnancies are talked about the, the conception that they are crisis pregnancies is just completely missed within the courtroom. So there's little to no discussion of the difficulties that these women have faced in terms of being able to conceptualize and understand their pregnancies. Instead, pregnancy is represented as a very normal aspect of a woman's life and very much connected with these ideas that we hold in society around women's connection to what it means to be a mother. So within feminist literature, this is known as the myths of motherhood. So as you can see from the, the quote here, the notion that no woman is truly complete or fulfilled unless she has kids, the woman remains the best primary caretaker of children, and that any remotely decent mother um, is a woman who will devote her entire physical, psychological, emotional, and intellectual well-being to her children 24-7. And this is very much... Uh, we can see this idea being reflected throughout the, the transcripts and throughout the hearings that this sense of this woman should have done everything she could to, to be the good mother as soon as she found out she was pregnant. And we see this closely relate, related to and, and um, connected with this idea that to be the good mother, you have to be the responsible mother, which means being the responsible pregnant woman. So as soon as you become pregnant, you need to do everything you can to put that fetus before your own welfare and your own well-being. And part of that is if letting people know you're pregnant and letting people help you to manage any risk that your fetus might experience and might uh, be subject to in many respects because of the conduct of that pregnant woman. So as I said here, there's no such thing as a no risk pregnancy. It's kind of even a woman who isn't in the sort of crisis situation that I've just described, all women, the sense that actually all pregnancy is inherently risky and women need to defer to medical experts in order to stop that risk from happening. Obviously, in this respect, thinking about these cases, 
these women were certainly not in a position to think about the welfare of the fetus before their own. The pregnancy was a crisis. They certainly weren't you know, thinking about their role as a mother to this child. And actually, in many respects, self-preservation was a large part of, uh, of a description of their conduct. I've just realized that quote, I was meant to, I'm gonna talk about that quote later. So I was meant to remove it from that slide. So we'll just ignore that for now. So what I'm gonna do, do now is just go through sections and examples from the transcript and some of the themes that have come out and just show how I've, I've reached this conclusion around how these women are being represented as, as failed mothers and um, as uh, kind of irresponsible pregnant women. So the first key idea that comes through is this idea that one of the failures of these women across these cases, again, regardless of whether or not she has been convicted of murder, because there's evidence that she um, actively killed the child and, and uh, had intent to kill the child, or if she was actually convicted of concealment of birth in an instance where the fetus was born alive, uh, sorry, beg pardon, the fetus was born dead and she effectively disposed of the body. So the failure to put the fetus first, again, this goes back to this idea of if you feel the responsible pregnant woman, you will put the fetus first. It's the natural thing for any loving and good mother to do. But as we can see here, so this is the case of Hannah. Again, I should just say I've actually changed names here. Um, it felt appropriate for me to do that as none of these cases were published. Um, so it just it didn't feel right to be using these women's real names in order to, to kind of um, to to use and share my research. There, were, there didn't seem a benefit to do that. And it seemed a, an unfair thing to do to the women. So um, the case from Hannah here, Hannah, just to, to give you some background, she um, concealed her pregnancy, gave birth on her own, and then she abandoned, uh, she, she stated that she passed out after the birth and that when she woke up, the baby had died. And then she abandoned the baby's body um, afterwards. So this is the prosecution saying the Crown's case is that she made it very plain she didn't want the child and she could not have the child out of wedlock. She told no one for these reasons. She sought no assistance with the birth and she sought to keep it secret. She sought no assistance with the newborn child and it died without any attempt, it would appear, by the defendant to give it to the care the child required. Now just, I mean, there's a, there's a lot going on in Hannah's case that, that needs some unpacking. Firstly, the fact that she, she states that she... Uh, was unconscious after birth and that uh, when she woke up the baby had already died so I think there's there was already a question here as to her criminal responsibility she pleaded guilty so there was no kind of discussion or, or um, uh, analysis of the evidence that was brought against her as to whether or not she had in fact committed the criminal offence of child cruelty but this idea here and I, what I find quite interesting about what the prosecution has said is the way they connect her conduct while she was pregnant so the fact that she didn't want the baby and that's why she she kept the pregnancy secret and then that's also why she didn't assist with the birth directly to what she did or what she said to have done after the newborn child was done, uh, was born in the sense that she didn't then seek assistance for the child when she then had a legal responsibility to, to um, attempt to um, a legal duty to protect it so there's this again this connection here between this idea of putting the fetus first actually meant conduct whilst pregnant, not just conduct once the child uh, was alive or born alive. And connected to this, what's, well, again, this is Hannah's case, quite interesting with this, and um, the way in which this, this representation is put forward, because the prosecution very much went down the lines of, you know, this is the bad woman. She's had a previous abortion. She tried to get an abortion for this pregnancy, but she was too late. She then concealed the pregnancy. She put herself first. She didn't tell anybody she was pregnant. She didn't seek assistance with the pregnancy or with the labor. And she did all of this because she wanted to protect herself. She's the bad mother. But then in response, the defense coming back and saying, well, you know, we need to remember here. So, um, but lest there be any misinterpretation about her behavior, this is not, I would submit before you, a callous, hard-hearted individual. Um, but we effectively, we need to remember she's a grieving mother. Um, and, I just I think something that is just fascinating here and I can completely understand why the defense went down this route of effectively trying to rebut what's being said by using these myths of motherhood and this idea that a woman is an inherent mother and you know she did what she did because she was grieving and she was in shock and she didn't know she didn't know what was going on and it, so it, I find it quite interesting that this isn't just simply the prosecution pushing forward this narrative of um good or bad motherhood, the defense are kind of using this as well. And the way in which that is shaping how 
these women are being represented and their conduct is being um, portrayed. Similarly, again, with, with Alice, so Alice's child actually survived. She, um, she uh, um, fed it and clothed it uh, after birth and then left it in a park uh, with the, the hope that somebody would find it soon afterwards. And again, so interestingly represented here, part of what was um, argued as the reason why she did this was because she, when she found out she was pregnant, she feared that she would lose her three other living children. Um, so she hid her pregnancy in order to, to prevent social services effectively from being involved and potentially removing all four children from her. And there's very much this sense put forward by the judge that actually while her conduct of abandoning the baby was, was certainly negative conduct and not something that anybody would support, this sense that actually she did it almost because she is the good mother, because she was trying to be the good mother to her, her existing children. Obviously, she's made the wrong decision by abandoning it, but nevertheless, it was, it was done for almost for the right reasons because she was you know, actively um, acting as this good mother. So again, going back to this idea of women's managing of their risk. So this is kind of more of a broader theme that came across. So rather than simply the risk that they pose themselves to the individual fetus, it's the managing of the, the broader risk related to their pregnancy. So as I've already said, we have these ideas around to be a good pregnant woman, to be a good mother, you very much let people in and let people help manage the risk that you might pose to your, your fetus. So you, you go to your antenatal care appointments, those, those aspects, you seek assistance in labor. But again, we, we see um, these women very much being put forward as if they, um, they themselves, because they didn't manage that risk, because they didn't tell people that they were pregnant, that is part of where their fault and, uh, lies in terms of their conduct. So Tanya, who did actively kill the child, she stabbed her infant after, uh, no, I beg your pardon, she suffocated her infant after it was born. There was this, um, this discussion as part of um, her sentencing hearing around if actually all of this could have been prevented, firstly, if she hadn't had sex, so Tanya was 16 years old, so if she hadn't actually had sex when she probably shouldn't have been having sex as a young girl, she wouldn't have been pregnant in the first place, so you know this wouldn't have happened. And then secondly, if she'd simply told somebody she was pregnant, then somebody could have stopped her. So again, this focus on it's actually, it's the pre-birth conduct and her failure to manage that risk that she posed to the fetus that continues to be put forward. Again, in terms of, so this is a, another case where, so Sophie um, accessed um, uh, abortion medication. She was about 32 weeks pregnant when she took them. Um, and the, it, although it's not known for certain, the um, belief is that the um, huge amount of abortion medication that she took would have caused such severe contractions of her uterus that the fetus would have died in utero as a consequence of, um, of the medication. And very much they were talking about here of um, the key aggravating feature in relation to Sophia, in relation to her conduct was, was the time and the, uh, the energy that was put into her uh, research to find the medication that she could use. And instead, so this is the judge kind of saying this, actually what you could have done is you could have put that same level of time and energy into your personal and your psychiatric problems. And as a consequence of that, somebody could have stopped you doing what you did to the fetus. So again, this sense that actually part of Sophie's failure here is that she hasn't managed that risk that she posed to that fetus. And then finally, so this is, this is touching on what I've um, talked about here in terms of this menu of criminal offences that um, the Crown Prosecution Service have to be able to pick, what, uh, pick an, an offence to be able to charge a woman with, regardless of the, the circumstances. Um, there's always something they can effectively capture her wrongdoing with. And actually what we see here is this, this, I would argue, blurring of the significance of the born alive rule. So to remind those who perhaps aren't in the legal profession, if the child is born alive, homicide and um, crimes against um, children will be the, the forms of offences that can be used. If the child is not born alive, then other offences such as procuring a miscarriage or child uh, concealment of birth are much more likely to be employed. But we see here that there's discussion all the way through um, a lot of these cases that actually it's the, the, a big part of the wrongdoing of the woman was that they prevented the fetus and the child from living. So this real suggestion here and, and, and idea that actually 
Um, as soon as she became pregnant and as soon as she's, you know, kind of continued that pregnancy, the expectation is that the fetus and child will absolutely survive. Again, just to remind you, all of these cases are crisis pregnancies. Um, and yet we, so we see this, so I've already talked about Hannah's case, but we see this specifically in terms of Sally's case. So Sally uh, experienced four, um, uh, well, so um, several years after she had given birth to these babies, the bodies of four babies were found in her bedroom. The, because due to the, the period of time that had elapsed between her giving birth and the, the bodies being found, there was no way of finding out whether or not they were born alive and Sally argues they were all stillborn. So she was convicted of concealment of birth of these bodies. But the language here, so, you know, whilst the circumstances and reasons of the stillbirths will never fully be able to be established, your chaotic lifestyle choices, including alcohol abuse and promiscuity at the time of your pregnancies, was such to put the good health of any unborn child at risk. So obviously the judge definitely isn't saying here, you killed the baby, like they're stillborn because of you, you know, that, well, well maybe, maybe that is what the judge is saying. That is not what the law is saying because the law can't say that here in England and Wales, we don't have fetal homicide laws. And yet there very much is this suggestion that actually it is again, her pre-birth conduct that is actually a big part of the wrong here. And potentially she is in fact, the cause of the stillbirth of the babies. Again, no evidence, no evidence at all that that might have been the case. Again, connected to this, so um, Haley, who um, also um, obtained medication to procure a miscarriage. She was very late in her pregnancy when she took this medication. And the discussion all the way through this case um, that was put forward by the judge in relation to her conduct and the significance of her conduct very much, she came incredibly close to effectively saying she had committed a homicide offence, when of course she hadn't, uh, because, and the reason, well, Certainly there was no evidence she had because the body of the fetus was never found, but the belief is it probably died prior to birth. But again, this suggestion, the seriousness of the criminality here lies in that whatever stage life can be said to begin, the child in the womb was so near to birth that in my judgment, all right thinking people would consider this offence more serious than an unintentional manslaughter or any offence on the calendar of murder. So this very clear kind of moral signalling here that actually what she has done is effectively a fetal homicide. It is not procuring a miscarriage. I've got a whole other paper on the fact that procuring a miscarriage is not about the killing of a fetus. It is about the ending of a pregnancy. So perhaps that's something to, uh, to go into in questions if anybody's interested. So just to wrap up here then, these, the ideas that I think go across these cases uh, that I've talked about, so this assumption that a woman will be the good mother, the good pregnant woman who will do everything she can to protect the fetus and the child. And the significance of that, particularly when we look at cases like this, because a woman doesn't come to this situation unless she is in crisis. It is just not normal conduct. She is in some form of crisis or another. And yet this suggestion here that a woman is always going to conform to these myths that we hold around feminine, motherly, womanly conduct, um, the, the kind of moral signification that's put around these cases and used, and the ways in which they are drawn upon by the prosecution to push forward a particular offence, a particular position in terms of her wrongdoing, but then also used by the defence to try and bat that position back. Of, so remember back to um, Hannah's case of, no, 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 don't forget, she's the grieving mother. And yet through all of this, what we effectively can't do is we, uh, um, that isn't being done is the recognition of these women's individual uh, vulnerability, um, as well as I would argue, and, and this is probably a different paper from today, the responsibility that wider society plays in these situations. It plays in the fact that we don't protect women who are in violent relationships particularly well. So if she's having to hide her pregnancy from a violent partner because she's terrified about what he will do to her if he finds out, we don't as a society particularly protect women well in those situations. So when the situation evolves and she ends up hiding that pregnancy, giving birth on her own and the baby dying, actually what we do is we then use the blunt force of the criminal law in order to situate her as the sole cause of that child's death and the sole kind of wrongdoer and wrong perpetrator. And then we use these moral signifiers around what women should do in terms of protecting a fetus and being a good mother to, to really kind of reiterate the wrongness of her behavior. So this is just this final point that I've, I've got here that 
one of the things that that I think is is significant about these cases the, is the ways in which they are used to dictate and uh, mirror and regulate normal maternal standards that are expected of all women. These women who are prosecuted are at, at very much at the you know the, the the tip of the iceberg of this. Um, wrongful female conduct that is reflected in lots of these cases in terms of women's failure to do what they should to protect the fetus. So I'll leave that there. And if anybody wants a copy of the book, here is a discount code for you. <laughs> so 30% off there if you use Emerald 30 on the Emerald website. I think you're on mute. Thanks, Emma. That's fantastic, that presentation. Um, I haven't put the correct link in the chat. I've just done a link to the book. So if you want to put the Emerald link in the chat and then everyone can see the website and where they can get their 30 percent off, which is um, a fantastic opportunity that I didn't know you were going to give to us. So thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, we'll come to a Q&A after I've spoken because I just want to pick up on some of the themes that Emma has given us today and just to tell you a few stories as is always in these Libertas lectures I follow up um, with some stories from my career in the hope that that will help you if you are a legal practitioner or frankly anyone who's interested in this uh, field to understand um, really what I consider to be the duties of the lawyers working in these cases to understand um, how these cases are working or or not working. Just checking you can still hear me. I just seem to have lost my Zoom for a moment. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. All right. I'll just keep going because I'm not sure where my... There you all are. I'm just scrolling past and losing you for a moment. All right, keep going. So I first came to this topic um, within my role as a barrister rather than from personal interest when I was in court in Nottingham about 20 years ago as a relatively young barrister who heard that Helena Kennedy was in the building and I thought well I'm going to go in and watch I'd like to see her in action and to see what case she's in and it was a plea hearing for a, an infanticide and as my memory is, and I'm testing my memory now, but I'm pretty confident this was right, that the uh, accused teenager had originally been charged with a homicide offence, which I just found quite remarkable. When I tell you the story, I'm rather hoping you'll agree with me, but she'd originally been charged with a homicide offence. The prosecution had accepted a plea to infanticide and this was the day of sentence. And as we know, in England and Wales, generally, the plea hearing leads to sentence on the same day. Now, for those of you who know me, I appear in other jurisdictions and I actually rather prefer the approach in Australia that there's a plea hearing and then a separate date for sentence that gives the judge the opportunity to prepare a judgment on sentencing that contains all the relevant material. But this, obviously, 20 years ago in England and Wales, was an opportunity to see a fantastic silk in action in this very complicated case. Um, now, my memory is that the young woman was a teenager. She had indeed hidden her pregnancy. My memory is that she was living alone with her father. And the first question is, why was she so frightened of her father that she couldn't tell him she was pregnant? And I sat there wondering what was the criminal responsibility here? This was a teenage girl who was plainly in crisis. We learned about her um, psychiatric issues because she'd been in therapy afterwards and had had some treatment afterwards, who was plainly not in a relationship with her father where she could freely discuss with him her situation. Uh, she'd gone a very long time hiding the pregnancy from everyone which suggested she didn't have anyone to confide in or anyone to help her. And as I say, I don't remember, that I, my memory is she was living alone with her father. I can't remember what had happened to her mother, but there, therefore she was also a child of some form of broken or ended relationship. So 
for me, this was a, a child who should have had support and certainly not the sort of investigation that led to um, a homicide charge or indeed any charge whatsoever. I sat there thinking, well, what is her criminal responsibility? And what was really interesting was there was a sort of frisson between the judge and the prosecution that this had all been sorted out. Of course, the taking of the infanticide plea was enough. Nothing really needed to be said. That was the solution. And why was this Helena Kennedy really going to bother saying anything? Because the judge probably wasn't going to send her to prison anyway. There was this sort of feeling that it was a done deal at the point of plea. And what I thought was fantastic was Helena stood up and told everybody the story. She didn't just say, um, well, if you're not going to send my client to prison, I don't need to say anything. I know we don't put it like that, but you get the point. She didn't accept the indication that the judge saw this as a foregone conclusion. He'd, I've read all the materials. Do you have anything to say? It was something along those lines. And I just thought it was fantastic. And I've copied it ever since to stand there and say, no, you're going to listen to me. And you're going to listen to this teenager's story of how she gave birth on the kitchen floor in silence uh, because she didn't want her father to know she was pregnant. She had no one to call, gave birth in silence. Then, of course, the baby started to cry. She got a pair of scissors to cut the umbilical cord. She took the baby outside and then she she killed the baby. And of itself, of course, it's horrific to hear that sort of story. But at the same time, the the idea that this girl was in that situation immediately post giving birth to a baby in silence I just couldn't understand why she was criminally responsible at all but of course you can you can see how Helena had worked so hard to negotiate an outcome that at least led to a non-custodial penalty and plainly the investigations were totally problematic they were not approached from a child protection um direction for her to me she was a child who needed child protection and child services and part of the mitigation read out on that day was part of her therapy and she'd uh, been I think with a psychiatrist there were various reports and obviously I don't know all the detail because I only heard what I heard in court I chose to copy that method of of making sure you get the person's story before the court and part of it was letters that she'd been encouraged to write to her dead child and they were the most moving letters that I've I've still ever heard and they really demonstrated how much she loved her child and how much she was grieving and how um little control if any that she'd had over the events that had happened immediately after the birth um, and again, for me, it, it didn't feel as though there was any criminal responsibility at all. So um, it's something that obviously you don't get many briefs in these situations. We don't get many cases, but I think the cases that we do get don't seem to be done very well. And I think that's the message that we've heard from, from you, Emma. And I think it'd be interesting to understand from you in the Q&A um, whether it's possible to put a percentage on the ones that you were worried about, where people may not have had any criminal responsibility at all, where they might have actually been not guilty and they pleaded to, guilty to something, perhaps in some form of negotiation. And I think this came to my mind uh, more recently in relation to the case that was dealt with in September of 2020 in Australia, the case of Gwoad, which was a woman who drove her children into a lake or a river. And it was a car with, I think my memory is it's several, five children. Um, and one was very, very young. So it was, uh, and it was quite interesting that the pleas were to murder and then one infanticide. And the case went to the High Court of Australia, which is the equivalent of the Supreme Court in the UK, on whether or not the murder sentence should have been reduced because there was an infanticide. So there was an acceptance that she had some form of mental impairment in relation to one, but not in relation to the others. And that seemed shocking to me. If you accept she's got a mental impairment in relation to one, surely she has a mental impairment in relation to them all. And the, the High Court was, I thought, quite stuck in the sense that they said, well, 
it was a murder plea and therefore it's a murder. So you can't reduce the murder sentence uh, because of the infanticide plea. But, and you genuinely felt, well, surely they can find a way. Surely they can find a way to say this is such incredible vulnerability that even the murder sentence should be reduced. And I think that was a seriously lost opportunity and a real disappointment that the, when a Chief Justice of Australia is a woman, not to say, well, actually, a murder sentence can be substantially reduced in exceptional circumstances. And in my opinion, it's exceptional an exceptional circumstance for a woman to drive her children into water there must be uh, those must be the sorts of cases that we treat as exceptional uh, and yet in the court of appeal below the high court of australia it had been described as one of the most heinous crimes ever and i again i felt that this was a total misunderstanding of what was a, an absolutely horrific family circumstance and of course we're horrified at children dying but it's very, very different from those cases where children die at the hands, usually of men, by revenge. Those are the cases that we should be feeling angry about, it seems to me. But again, in Australia, there's a very good example, terrible story of poor Rosie Batty, whose son was killed on the cricket field by her ex-partner, who frankly killed him as an act of revenge in front of his mother and you can google Rosie Batty and all the amazing work that she's done in relation to domestic violence so here we had um, a real juxtaposition of cases it seemed to me uh, children killed in revenge to a partner as part of some sort of ongoing horrific domestic abuse situation and children killed by a mother in crisis. And I genuinely don't think the criminal justice system on either sides of the world have really approached it properly. Those are the cases that carry criminal responsibility. And as Emma has told us, these cases involving these women are very much women in crisis. So I think there's a real value in reconsidering prosecution altogether. I think there is real value in seeking to persuade the Crown Prosecution Service not to prosecute these types of cases, to develop a better policy. But if you're briefed in one of these cases to really try and work on persuading the prosecution not to prosecute um, and to keep trying that, not just orally, but producing materials. Um, and I'm going to give some practical advice on that in a moment. Um, and if and I think there is a move to understanding this in more general society. I think it's slow. But the example that I've been chatting about recently is the television programme Homeland. Now, I don't know how many of you have watched it, but Claire Danes has Nick Brody's baby. She's in the CIA. He is or isn't a terrorist. Uh, and she gives birth to this lovely baby whom she loves. But there's a point at which she thinks about putting the baby's face under the bathwater and letting go. She's plainly depressed. She has mental health problems. She's a woman in crisis, even though she's got this amazing job. There's a recognition that she also has personal crises. And, and there in the middle of, of a, an American TV show was this moment that showed that this isn't criminal responsibility, it's, it's a mother in crisis. And I thought, well, you know, if the media have got there, maybe the criminal justice system can follow Claire Dane's example and to understand uh, these issues rather better. And that in turn made me think about that case 20 years ago, where one thinks about the non-custodial penalty. And really, probably the problem in England and Wales is that we don't have a non-conviction outcome. In Scotland, you might have not proven. In Australia, you can have a non-conviction outcome. So you might still have a community penalty, but it's not recorded as a criminal conviction. And I think there's a discussion to be had. If, we, if we're not at the point that we can move towards not prosecuting these women at all, which is where I would like to be, that you recognise that women are in crisis and you don't prosecute at all. If we're not in that position, at least have an option that doesn't give those women a criminal conviction that affects them for the rest of their lives when they're going to be affected by having lost their child, albeit in their own personal circumstances. Um, and these, these, these sorts of issues in relation to um, women are very prevalent when one looks at women in prison. So I did a four-year project for women 
uh, for LexisNexis on women in prison. And we know it's well researched across the world that women in prison have many, many, many vulnerabilities. So this is another example of where women's vulnerabilities are not being recognized. They may not all go to prison, but they're still subject to punishment and in fact, retribution some sort of condign punishment for being a bad mother or a little gold star for being generally a good mother, but this was really bad, which I think is the description that, that um, Emma has given us, rather than looking at criminal responsibility and what the framework of the law um, is. So I think understa understanding the vulnerabilities of women in prison shouldn't just relate to the women in prison, it must relate to all those women who are in the pipeline and at risk. And I thought about this, all of this again, when I was living in Darwin in the Northern Territory of Australia, and I was involved in the campaign to decriminalise reproductive, um, decriminalise abortion effectively. And it was put as a question of reproductive rights. And there was cross party support for removing a lot of criminal laws that were really draconian in relation to women who sought to terminate their their pregnancies. So a different context, but still how the criminal law has punished women um, in relation to born and unborn children in a really draconian way. And the outcome of that law actually was, um, in many ways, it had reached the point of being uh, ridiculous and cruel and shaming because where women sought to terminate pregnancies for all sorts of reasons, they almost had to line up on the tarmac and get on the abortion plane if there wasn't a doctor available, um, and then go to some other area of Australia to have, uh, have treatment for what is basically a health issue. So really shocking to see the treatment and shaming of women in, these, uh, in a range of circumstances. And then more recently, and the main reason I asked Emma to come and speak to us um, today was my recent experience of a case that I contacted Emma to ask for her expert help. Now I can't talk about it because sentence hasn't taken place so I'm not going to go into detail but I want to just talk about some of the issues that can arise in these types of cases. The first thing to say is in these types of complex cases I think it's really important to reach out to the academics who've done the research don't just read the last case or the last precedent or chat to someone in the roving room who says, I've done that sort of a case. Go and have a look at the academic research that's available. Buy the book. Um, uh, if you get a case of this type, buy her book anyway. But um, And I speak about this quite a lot in um, cases that I've done recently that you know I've talked about in previous webinars. So Jogi on complicity, um, Roe on HIV transmission. In, in those cases, um, Jogi, I had Dr. Mac Dyson and Dr. Beatrice Krebs, and Beatrice is one of our academic members at Libertas in um, HI, the HIV transmission case. I had Matthew Waite, um, who of course has done one of our webinars as well. And in this recent case, I've contacted Emma and Lorana Bartels in Australia to try and help me understand the academic research in this area, which includes analysis of cases, but also often surveys of women in the criminal justice system. And it allows you to identify the sorts of things you need to know as a lawyer in these types of cases. So first of all, the importance of procedural rights. Is this a case where your client should not be identified? That might have a knock on effect to her other children. So um, you've got to start thinking about whether you have an order that she is kept anonymous. Uh, and because there might be other children who are going to read about their mother in later life, or it may be that those children are in school and they're going to be uh, harmed by the treatment of others who are less understanding at school. There may be real reasons for asking for your client's identity to be to remain anonymous. It's a difficult one to ask for because of course we do have open justice, but I think a form of suppression order is a very good idea in these types of cases. Um, you might need to deal with a bail application if you have a police force that doesn't really understand the difference between homicide, infanticide, and the sorts of other offenses that Emma's talking about, um, particularly in relation to child destruction. <laughs> or where there isn't a body available. It may be a police force that really doesn't understand the nuances of this type, these different types of laws. 
and just assume that, it, that we do have some sort of fetal homicide when we don't. So for a bail application, you might need to pull together all the material that you might normally wait for for your plea and mitigation. You might need that academic research. You might need the research on women in prison. You, you might need all of those character references um, and as much as you can get in terms of reports at a very, very early stage. And, and that becomes useful, of course, in trying to persuade the prosecution not to prosecute if you've got all that material as early as possible. So bail applications shouldn't be a foregone conclusion, even if it looks like your client's going to get some sort of bail, conditional bail. You might need all of that material to persuade the police to give police bail or again to persuade a magistrate. Um, so really take the time in these types of cases to collect together sufficient material um, to get the courts to understand what, what you're talking about on behalf of your client. And really think about trauma-informed approaches, some general advice for the court on how to approach a woman in trauma. We have a lot of research and learning now about vulnerable witnesses. And this is an example of a vulnerable defendant. And actually the guidance on vulnerable people in court is, is developing very, very well. There are lots of toolkits now, including from the Advocates Gateway that I'm an, an ambassador for, um, of thinking about how you can persuade a court to be trauma informed and to understand the crises for that woman and, and how she might be re-traumatized by going through the court system. And then actually, frankly, give the judge a lesson on gender issues, use the academic research to get them to understand the position of women. It might not make you particularly popular, but it will mean they've got to read what you give them. And, provide some reasoning for the outcome that may or may not give you grounds of appeal. Now, I've come into a couple of cases recently where none of that was done in the lower court and I'm asked to deal with the appeal. And it's almost impossible to get an appeal court to overturn, a, uh, to reduce a sentence or overturn a conviction when the arguments haven't been run in the court below. So I think there's a real duty on us all to run those arguments in the court below even if you get the feeling that the judge is going to do what you want to make sure that these issues are publicly aired, uh, you might want to do things like limit the victim impact statement because those motivated to write those victim impact statements might be those very persons who were abusive to her when, um, when she was pregnant, or they might be the people who, who were in fact behind the reason why she didn't expose her pregnancy or didn't tell anyone she was pregnant. So you have to think about the people who say, well, we're very affected by losing our granddaughter or if it's a, a spouse and the wife has killed the child, there might be an issue around domestic violence. So have a think about limiting the use of victim impact statements. Have a think about the role of child protection services, particularly if you're representing a young woman um, who should have had protection herself. Um, it, there shouldn't be a culture of child removal or a culture of criticism, that the whole point of child protective services should be to encourage a mother um, to be able to progress in some way, especially if that's a mother who has other children. So there shouldn't be this immediate culture of removal of other children because there's been a pro problem with one child immediately after that child is born. Uh, collect those reports, get the character references, all of those things you would normally do. But the expert assessments need to be on both the incident, the state of mind, and of course, uh, issues around re-traumatization and post-traumatic stress disorder. What you're really asking a court to do is to balance child protection with acknowledging the value of not punishing women in crisis. And that's the real point. We should not be punishing women in crisis. We shouldn't be labelling women bad or good mothers. Usually they're women who are not well. And usually they're women who are loving, but acopic, not coping, not well. These are not people with criminal responsibility. These, these are people who should uh, not be punished, but given support. However shocking the incident may be to us, 
um, because we don't come across these very often. They're always going to be shocking. One has to understand that these are women in crisis, not to be punished, not to be labelled, but to be recognised as loving, but acopic, not coping. And we can understand that, can't we? Because on a broad moral front, we pretty much all know that parenting is tough. And some of us cope with it better than others. And some parents need more support than others. So if we know that as a general uh, position in society, then we're dealing with an exceptional circumstance. If we all know that parenting is tough, if we all know that some people cope better than others, if we all know that some parents need more support than others, it allows us to accept that these cases that, that Emma's talked about today are the exception. They are exceptional um, in the sense that they're at the, um, at the extreme of the problems that we all have being parents. And if they are extreme, that falls into an exceptional category that allows us to consider non-punishment and non-prosecution. Um, it allows us to, rec to direct those women to appropriate support networks, which are hopefully available and have been identified at an early stage, to consider what's needed around general care and what other support is needed to make sure that they're not they don't fall back into the same situation so that they're safe if it's a domestic violence situation, that they're not isolated if they have suffered from depression. In some cases, this is going to be an extension of their own self-harm. So um, they might have real self-harm issues and the killing of the child comes as an extension of that self-harm. I'm really thinking about uh, the health issues for those women. So it's a big job if you get these sorts of cases. You've got to acknowledge that people with mental health issues form relationships and have children. You've got to acknowledge that they're capable of enge um, engagement. You've got to pull together everything that you can pull together to uh, represent your client properly in the sense of, first of all, um, trying to persuade the prosecution that your client does not carry criminal responsibility. And if that's not successful, that your client should have some form of non-conviction outcome. And if that's not available, a community penalty. Um, I think it's obvious that, that Emma and I agree that, uh, that this is a, a, a way in which the court criminal justice system should be approaching women in crisis, but we're not there yet. So that's, I hope, helpful on practical things that you can do in these types of cases. But also for those of you more interested in changing policy, um, take these thoughts to, um, to the places that you work to see if you can engage in, in criminal justice reform. So Emma, back to you. I've rattled on again for quite a long time. I'm hoping some of you had some questions. So I'm going to ask Emma that one that I mentioned earlier on, and then I'll see what your questions are. If you do have a question, feel free to put your hands up or put it in the chat, however you'd like to ask your question. But Emma, are you able to help us on the proportions in the cases that you looked at in England and Wales? Um, can we get a feel for how many you thought might not have been guilty of what they were accused of? Is it possible to say that? Have we been doing a bad job as lawyers? I just unmute yourself. I'm always doing that. I did the same a moment ago. You think after all this time we'd have learned, right? No, we do it all the time. Yeah. I've done it in court as well. <laughs> it's terribly embarrassing, but yeah, we all do it. I think I mean, it's quite difficult to talk about proportions in terms of these cases because there's just so few of them. Yeah. Um, I did wonder if the answer was all of them, but. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it, yes. Um, so certainly, so I, I, I've, I've indicated around Hannah's case, that one particularly, I just, I just couldn't, I mean, I couldn't understand why they went for a prosecution, but then this sense that she, that the prosecution just ignored the fact that she claimed that she was unconscious. So, I mean, if she genuinely fell unconscious after birth, I think there's a real question of, does she bear any responsibility for the death of the child? And then I'm also convinced she actually didn't commit concealment to birth because she didn't actually hide the body or she didn't actually conceal the body. So her conviction, I'm, I'm, would definitely kind of feel is a bit iffy. The, we, the two recent convictions we've had for murder for two women who have killed newborn children, and they are, from my reckoning, 
some of the first convictions of women who have killed newborn children for murder I reckon possibly in about a hundred years it's wow. like it's been so rare because ever since the infanticide act was passed in 1922 so we're almost at 100 years it it's just almost been this unwritten rule that these women will either be prosecuted for infanticide or they will be prosecuted for murder and that and a guilty plea for infanticide will be accepted and I, I have no, this is more just like a hunch. I've got absolutely no evidence to support this. As I say, these cases are too few and far between to be looking to find patterns. But it, there does seem to be this sense that the prosecution just don't seem quite so keen on infanticide anymore. And they are quite keen to go for murder instead. Um, I really want to understand that. I really want to know why, which uh, the, the um, project Felicity, that you mentioned right at the, the top of what I'm going on to now is to, to talk to legal professionals to try and find out what, what are views on what these women do and on the application of the law. And I would particularly like to talk to members of the Crown Prosecution Service to try and understand, you know, what's the rationale for prosecuting? Because I, I feel I'm, I'm very close to where you are, Felicity, of should we be maybe there should be a written rule if it was an unwritten rule maybe absolutely. it's time to have a written rule yeah absolutely should we be prosecuting at all and then particularly in cases which traditionally would have been infanticide convictions which wouldn't have resulted in a woman being imprisoned what where's this suddenly come from of this mm -hmm. push for murder and refusal to accept infanticide yeah i've talked about that separately in a, in the context of fgm i campaign and still do on uh, eradicating fgm and having uh, sound laws that work together with health and education to eradicate fgm and then i was just totally saddened and disappointed by the one prosecution that we did have at the old bailey focused on witchcraft and not just which not witchcraft necessarily in relation to the child who was cut, but in relation to the police officers. And I, I just can't understand how that formed part of the evidence, even if it was um, obvious that she was engaging in re in witchcraft. Why was why was that drawn into such an important case on? on women's issues that uh, an FGM, of course, uniquely in relation to women and the reasons why it is directed at women and women's sexuality. So I think that is a concern that I already have, that there is this, um, perhaps this sense that we're going to treat women, even though they're only sort of nine or 10% of the offenders in the same way as men, which is retributed uh, with retribution. And that's sort of feeding its way into, well, we, if a man did this, we'd charge him with murder. So let's charge a woman the same, which is a total misunderstanding of what equity and equality means in a criminal justice system. But again, that's anecdotal and I haven't done the research, but it is very worrying. We've got a couple of um, really good questions. One here, um, if someone is utterly unaware of pregnancy and has the child who then passes away, what's the standpoint? Yeah, it, I mean, the standpoint seems to be it doesn't matter that she was completely unaware that she was pregnant. It's, the standpoint almost seems to be of, like she should have been aware. So like that's that seems to be um, the lens through which her conduct is looked through. Of she, She's already failed even before the child was born because of not being aware. And there was so there was one case where um so this again was a 16 year old and i think it's quite significant that she was 16 because i think if she'd been older potentially the outcome wouldn't have been the same she was actually prosecuted for infanticide so she um gave birth in a public space and then stabbed the child um after it had been born alive um and she it was a really odd case reading the um the sentencing hearing because so they had a psychologist who reported that she had a complete denial of pregnancy. Um, and I think what was quite interesting in this case compared to another case of a 16 year old who also said that she wasn't aware she was pregnant. In this, in the case where there was a psychologist saying she was completely unaware of the pregnancy, there was no evidence presented around her doing any Google searches or anything like that. Obviously what I don't know is perhaps there was nothing perhaps they searched her his search history and there was nothing to find so perhaps there is quite literally nothing to suggest she had any awareness of her pregnancy whereas the other the other girl the other 16 year old 
it was very much there was all this evidence presented of well she clearly knew she was pregnant so she's saying she's telling us she didn't know she was pregnant but clearly she must have done because why would she have been googling using night nurse while while pregnant if she didn't know she was pregnant so it again it, it seems to be one of those things that's very much used as a moral signifier of a woman not knowing she's pregnant somehow suggests a level of failure that she has experienced as a woman because of course you know we we're all just walking you know pregnancy time bombs aren't we so <laughs> you know how how could you not know you're pregnant and it, again this this I think goes back to the point I was making of this complete lack of comprehension of the concept of these being crisis pregnancies and the impact of that. Just a, a final case to mention, which again, a really kind of interesting, what I would see as a slight outlier case of a woman who was prosecuted for murder, pleaded infanticide and diminished responsibility bizarrely the jury jumped over infanticide and went for diminished responsibility which I I, I mean who knows why because infanticide is technically easier to to prove than diminished responsibility but that's a slightly different question but the this was a defense that I actually thought was a very well constructed defense they they used her lack of awareness of the pregnancy as the basis for the diminished responsibility so they used that as the the medical condition which um, caused her to kill the child that because she didn't know she was pregnant when she gave birth it was such a shock and that shock resulted in in um, the killing of the child so that was one instance where I think the defense did kind of get it and did get right we actively need to use this crisis pregnancy as the basis on which we are going to try and mitigate the the murder charge that's been put forward um, but generally the others again it seemed the fact that she didn't know she was pregnant or she didn't accept she was pregnant and she possibly had some awareness but we're not entirely certain how much very much seems to have been a stick that they used to beat women with as part of the hearing yeah look um, um it's it falls into all those you know you should have known better you're the mother that you never never hear or very rarely hear in relation to fathers who kill so um there's, there's a whole load of stereotypes and tropes in these types of cases that need to be battled and I often say certainly as a woman barrister you're fighting two battles one is your clients and the other is your own uh, but certainly when you're representing uh, someone in this situation you have to draw on um on as much as possible that you can learn from experts I think it's quite important not to compare your own personal circumstances either as parents I think that's where some of the cases that you've talked about have gone wrong you've got judges or barristers thinking about their own way of parenting when they've never been in that situation and we wouldn't normally do that if it were a burglary or some other form of homicide that somehow we get drawn into the court people's personal subjective opinions and I think that's why I'm really really keen that in these types of cases that there is that the courts lean on the research the courts are given the research and have a real understanding objectively of what these cases are about. And I think the, the sort of shocking nature of these cases is reflected in some of what we're receiving in, in the chat today. There are examples of people who can remember personal experience of work colleagues and children who uh, at least in their experience have demonstrated a lack of knowledge of pregnancy or a worry that you might have a situation where someone is worried they're pregnant and Googles things, but actually doesn't know whether they are or, persuades themselves that they're not so I think that's the only other thing that I think about is that um, we're all different mothers so we mustn't bring our subjective uh, opinion to the courtroom and certainly if you're a um, if you're a man or who uh, is sitting in judgment you probably do need an awful lot of help to think about the um, the issues that arise in these cases in order to avoid your own subjective opinion uh, when one is thinking about the the sentencing exercise um, it, these i don't think fit neatly into sentencing council guidelines at all great well thank you emma we've gone 10 minutes over time i um the question in our chat, the last one, I think I'm just going to leave open. I'm not going to ask, uh, ask you to answer it, but there's this fantastic question, which is why is the law holding women to such a high standard? 
And I think I would say, why is the law wrongly holding women to such a high standard? Why are we criminalising women in these situations? I think it's really, really important to have a criminal justice system that responds to the level of conduct that we consider to be criminal, to consider to have that level of criminal responsibility. My view is these types of cases, even if a weapon is used, because often it is, because there's the cutting of the umbilical cord that puts the weapon into the... Uh, the woman's hand that can lead to the death of a child we have to understand that not everybody's gone mad after they have a baby but some people are in crisis and ne it needs to be recognized that they don't carry that level of criminal responsibility um i suppose that's me on my soapbox really but i've been persuaded it, over my experience for as i say over 20 years for that opinion and i'm feel i'm supported in that opinion by what Dr. Emma Milne has told us today. Most importantly, doesn't matter what my opinion is, uh, I can, can I encourage you all to buy her book, um, to research these issues further, to reach out if you've got this sort of a case, if we've got some solicitors here who have this sort of a case and want, want some help in persuading the police or the prosecution not to prosecute, uh, we're always here to help and, uh, and um, we can provide research and assistance should you need it. So I think it only remains for me to thank Dr Emma Milne for giving us the benefit of her research and uh, certainly I will put my hand up to take part in your um, next research and where you interview legal professionals. I think it'd be really interesting to see the outcome um, and I hope you get lots of people to engage in that project. So thank you very much, Emma, for uh, giving us your Libertas lecture. And just to follow up, to let everybody know that we do try and turn these lectures into an article for our Libertas lens. So I'm going to encourage Emma to do us an article and uh, we'll get that out in one of our monthly newsletters and the video for this event will be up relatively soon when we can get the tech people to do it for us. So thank you very much, Emma. Uh, indeed, thank, thank you. you. Take care, everyone. I'll say goodbye and switch you all off. I've got that power to end the meeting for everyone, I think, or maybe Gary, one of our clerks has. I think we've got Gary and Louis here. So somebody can switch us all off. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Emma. Bye-bye.